Well, what a great start we've got off to finding these elephant. I'm sure a lot of you may have already seen them on the Juno waterhole cameras. They're drinking at the little waterhole just above that. And welcome on board the Sunset Safari. My name is Scott, if you haven't met me before. Oh, what a and great start we've got. The next couple of days. Also, the walking backpack will not be out, so you are going to be stuck with myself for the next three hours. And I'm certainly looking forward to it. It's a very different experience for us and for you when there is only one vehicle. And like most things in life, there are pros and cons to that. Anyway, we're going to creep a little bit closer towards these elephants. It's a wonderful afternoon, about 26 degrees Celsius, 79 degrees Fahrenheit. There's some clouds scattered about the western horizon, not too much out to the east. That's why there's a by hashtagging Safari Live on Twitter or sending an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. We can't see the pipe from here, but it's in that small little hole that they're digging their trunks into, and that's why they are all placing their trunks at the very same place at the base of this little hole. There's the sunshine. So the clouds moved out the way now. This is two mothers with their calves of very similar ages and I really love watching the interaction between mother and calf. They form extremely strong bonds. And for the male calves, they'll be around their mothers for at least 10 years before they probably leave their natal herd. and join a small bachelor herd where they'll move together and wait for them to get big enough to start competing for females. I can see that the youngster that's sandwiched between the two big cows is a young bull. The other one I haven't had a good look at, but look at that. The one on the right is busy suckling. Wonderful. The mammary glands are Unlike a lot of other mammals, which are situated at the back of their stomach, the elephants are similar to us. It's between the front legs. And I guess a calf of that size may be starting to get weaned off. And that's why the mother didn't tolerate her suckling for very long. <laughs> While this youngster is trying to push his mother out the way to get a turn to drink. And they're all actually taking turns gently nuzzling one another out the way. Come on, Mom, let me in. The pipe's probably one inch in diameter, so what you'll find is her whole prehensile fingertip is probably strapped over the whole circumference of that pipe. Not sure if the youngster's trunk would be big enough to do that. Well, for those of you who were around for the Sunrise Safari, 
you will remember James having a great sighting with a female leopard that we don't see very often. Her name is Quatile. And he saw her on Arethusa. I'm told there was very clear signs that she is nursing cubs or that she's got very prominent teats. So she either has cubs or is going to have cubs very shortly. So that's exciting prospects. Let's hope she continues to spend time on Arethusa. She typically spends time further south of us, but he got to see her. And there was also reports of a female leopard seen on Juma from a vehicle that was on its way to drop their kid off at primary school outside the reserve. But we couldn't race there fast enough to relocate that leopard. But I think the tracking team will be heading out into that area this afternoon. So... Those are the updates regarding the leopard that we have from this morning. From a vehicle that was on its way to drop their kid off at primary school outside the reserve. But we couldn't race there fast enough to relocate that leopard. But I think the tracking team will be heading out into that area this afternoon. So... Those are the updates regarding the leopard that we have from this morning. To the lion is that the Birmingham Coalition, all five of them, have been found south of us. And I'm told they're very, very close to three of the Styx lionesses. And there's no sign of the remaining cub, the young male. So maybe he's dead or maybe he's just tucked away in a pocket. That wasn't very nice. One car really bullied the other calf there and jabbed it with a tusk. Anyway, so there's some interesting behavior. The Birminghams were vocalizing this morning and those lionesses were very close by. So they certainly know that they are there, but the males don't know that the females are there. Well, because they are very close and heard the males vocalizing and didn't run off, I mean, we can read into that that the females are becoming more comfortable with the Birmingham males, and that is... Typical behavior after the initial rage and anguish between prides of lioness and marauding males coming in trying to establish a territory of their own. And the Matimba males are even further south of those Birmingham males, considerably so, so they seem to be spending a lot more time in an area where they usually didn't. And it'll be interesting to see if and when they do come back to challenge the Birmingham boys or if they are just going to occupy the small pockets of central southern Sabi sands where they are currently being seen. can hear a crested barbet calling in the background and there's a lot of bird song around at the moment it's incredible how much the bush is really becoming alive not only with the birds but also the insects the reptiles after these first rains that we had must also say the vegetation is coming alive and there's a very faint lick of green over this clearing and surroundings we're not leaving these elephants, but I would like to show you something quickly in the meantime, also regarding birds. And I think we found our first bird nest of the season. I'm not sure if any of the other presenters have managed to find one, but just before we started the show, we noticed a birchal starling. And going to stop here. It flew up into a small cavity in a tree, a ah! old knobthorn tree. Ah! And Jandre is just busy zooming into that. You'll start to notice there's the cavity. Ah! So the birds are going to be beginning to find a lot of different nesting sites.
Oh, look, there's a tiny little lizard there. Well, I wasn't expecting to see that. It looks like a little skink to me, but it's a bit far off to tell exactly what it is. Interestingly, though, the Birchall starling appeared to be having a tussle with some squirrels that obviously also occupy some of the cavities within this tree, specifically this one. And we actually got to see the starling chasing the squirrel. And there's going to be a lot of competition for nesting sites between mainly the birds, but also from time to time birds and squirrels who occupy very similar homes. And I really love finding the different birds' nests, a lot of which are in cavities and trees. The hornbills will also nest in cavities and trees. And it's something that we can monitor over the next few weeks and months. I've actually just seen the Birchall starling. I'm guessing it's the same one. It'll be interesting just to wait a moment or two to see if it doesn't come back and land in this cavity. What it'll probably be doing at the moment is beginning to make it comfortable to lay the eggs inside. So I don't think they've started laying eggs just yet. And what we may be lucky enough to see is them carrying nesting material to line this little cavity with. There's also another very interesting bird while we wait for the Birchall starling. He's actually sitting on his knees. It's usually a lot taller than that, probably about 40 centimeters taller. And what it's done is it's folded its legs forwards at the knee joints. So its feet will be below its beak. And it looks a lot shorter than it is now. It's probably about 1.2 to 1.4 meters in height. And we got a brief glimpse of the elephant suckling earlier. And I said it's probably starting to get weaned and we've just got a question through from Phil. He's interested to know how old will elephant be when they are weaned off milk and just like humans I guess a lot will depend on the individual fill and youngsters will start eating vegetation from roughly about six months of age they'll start consuming their own vegetation albeit quite slowly and clumsily because they don't have good control of their trunks and what they'll often do is they'll actually just avoid using their trunk and sometimes go down onto their knees to bite onto something that they would like to eat so they do start substituting milk with, with plant matter from about six months of age. And anywhere from about two years of age can you expect to start seeing them getting weaned off. And we were lucky enough to actually be around when there's a specific female elephant who's got a short trunk. She probably lost the end of it in a snare, which is a wire noose that poachers will use to, in, in, or in, to capture prey. And the problem with these snares is that any animal that walks through them and is unlucky enough to put a limb or a trunk into this wire noose or hole, the noose will then tighten and strangle the animal or possibly cut its leg off. In this case, it cut the elephant's trunk off. Anyway, her trunk, she's very easy to distinguish because she does have this short trunk. And for about a month, we could hear this little youngster of hers complaining throughout the reserve. Wah! Every time it tried to drink and its mother wouldn't let it day and night and we've seen that same calf now come to terms with it a few months later and now it doesn't hassle its mother anymore so that was quite interesting to see speaking of the elephants i think oh yeah the starlings just in time as i was about to leave and i can see the one on the right's got something in its beak chandre so probably some nesting material looks like a bit of elephant dung what a nice way to line your home. Yay! Awesome. And this will be a monogamous pair. And a lot of the birds in this area actually do form monogamous bonds. But not all of them. And interestingly you get some females of a certain species who will actually get the males to incubate and raise the eggs 
and the chicks once they've hatched. And like I said, quite exciting stuff. I love these birds' nests and monitoring them. And this is the first one that I've noticed this summer season. Some of the birds are actually clever enough to nest in winter because A, there's less competition for nesting sites and B, there's also less competition for food because about half of the birds we get in this area will migrate away for the summer months. Oh, sorry, for the winter months. And only half remain during the winter. The saddlebald stork has now got some friends, two hardy dar ibis, which specialize in plucking their prey from under the ground. And they've got those long beaks that they can probe into crickets' holes, or just randomly into the earth, hoping to pull out worms or any little insects. And they must be loving the soft ground after the rains because the winter months must be really tricky for them to bury their beaks into the hard ground. Well, earlier I mentioned that we're experiencing a lot of change after our first rains and our Pamela has asked has spring sprung in the Sabi sands and it certainly has Pamela it most certainly has there's evidence of a few of the early bloomers already pushing out their first shoots but we will see a uh, Massive change in the coming weeks and a lot more flowers will pop up, a lot more plants and little seedlings will start to germinate and, and grow. So it's the very early stages of spring you could say, but there certainly it has sprung. I want to just try and creep ahead of these elephants. I think we may have missed out. There's too much avian action and they're heading down into an area where it may be a little bit thick and tricky to follow them. I if it was a female, she would lack those yellow wattles and she would have a yellow eye instead of a black eye. We've been very, very spoiled with the amount of sightings we've had of saddlebilled storks, but it's important to know that there are not very many of them in this massive 3 million hectare ecosystem that we are a part of, the Kruger National Park. And there's believed to only be about a hundred pairs in that whole area, which is bigger than Wales. Isn't it wonderful that we've got an ecosystem bigger than an entire country? But the good thing is about them is once they do find a place that they like, they tend to localize themselves there and then sightings become frequent. But they are certainly not a common bird. Very good. Now a lot of you may be wondering what exactly are my plans for the afternoon. It's a good question and I'm not entirely sure but I am probably going to head across to Arethusa slash the western portions of Juma in the hope that we can try and find any sign of shadow a female leopard and a cub Madiba he's about one year old now and it's been a while since I've seen them so we'd really like to spend some time with them as I'm sure a lot of you would and with too much intelligence to go on four other predators sniff of some grass and wasn't quite sold by it so avoided it and I was breaking off a branch of this acacia tree which she obviously thinks is going to be more tasty 
but it emphasizes how they are quite fussy feeders and will feed on specific plants at different times of the year and just like I was saying earlier how they can also be quite fussy regarding their water that they drink it's also the food and at this time of the year even after just one decent rainfall they're already going to start getting spoiled with more and more options of what to feed on My earpiece popped out. Sorry, Louise. Looks like a lot of them are attacking some grass that's growing off the dam wall there. Got this female coming charging in here and I think it's mainly because she had a little downhill run up that got her going. And it's my favorite thing to watch elephants build up momentum as they head up or down or head down a little slope and she almost planned to try and get up this embankment and thanks to Jean Ray's nifty camera work he got you across there in time I think a lot of people may have been confused by that and thought that she was charging them but it's often just the slope that they enjoy moving down at a faster speed which is understandable I really love the way a lot of our viewers are so observant and often notice things that we don't notice and Kathleen has just pointed out that she saw a little bald patch on the chest of the saddlebill stalk that we were looking at earlier and she's interested to know if that's got anything to do with mating. I don't think so Kathleen and if anything for me I think it would be a perfect patch to help incubation so when they lie on the eggs, it's skin on egg. And sometimes both males and females will have these patches. But what's also important to remember is sometimes these patches are not visible and sometimes they are, even on the same species. But if anybody's got some more insight into the little bald patches on birds' chests, please feel free to share your wisdom with us. What a beautiful shot this is. Happy family going for a walk. You also notice it's quite nice as we're facing away from them. They're flapping their ears intermittently. And this is a cooling mechanism. It's not the hottest afternoon, so they're not fanning the ears very often but each time they fan their ear they cool blood which is being pumped through a network of arteries and veins in their ears and that's a very vital adaption that the African elephants have to keep them cool in the very hot climates that they live in and allow them to move for hours every day searching for food because they do need to feed on so much vegetation every day these big females probably feed on anywhere from 120 to 160 kilograms of vegetation every day. Oh, 
Sean, I've just heard an update which we will sadly not be able to go to, but a lot of you will be interested to know that quarantine is alive and well, and he's on Cheetah Plains to the east of us. So probably around three kilometers, and I've just heard Craig give that update on the radio. And it was in this very same drainage line or riverbed that flows down from the Juma Dam where we last viewed him. He had a dike occur and I'm fairly certain that was the last time we got to see him, probably around two weeks ago. I'm just going to get on the radio and thank Craig for that update and tell him that we've got these elephants over here and that not too much too much else is going on just yet. Thanks for that update Craig. There's a breeding herd of elephants slowly mobile east away from the Juma waterhole and I don't think all your techs are out yet. Negative, no luck. This is really cute. The calf's reaching up and I think it's actually trying to pluck food out of its mother's mouth. It can't reach the branches itself. And earlier it had its trunk literally in its mom's mouth. And because it couldn't get to the food that she was feeding on, it's attempting to now suckle, but that doesn't seem to be working out either. You just saw it toss that little stick almost in frustration. it's picking up the little bits that its mother's dropping as she feeds. And another good observation and it's just come through from Gail. And Gail's interested to know if I think that this big female that we're looking at here could be pregnant. And I think you are right. It does appear to be a bit of an extra bump protruding. And this is a great angle to see it from. And also looking at the size of that young calf, it looks around two and a half to three years of age so it does match up with the elephant's breeding cycle and it's usually every three to four years roughly that an elephant will give birth after a 22 month gestation period. Well, you can see that little speed wobble that I was talking about earlier. They both accelerated a little bit downhill. Up or not quite the same. Well, it's been really wonderful chatting with a few of you so far, so keep sending through your questions. The next person I'm going to be talking to is a very young Isabella, just four years old. Good to know you're watching Isabella. And Isabella also has noticed something, and that is that the elephant's skin is very wrinkly. And she would like to know why. Is it because of the fact that they love water? And they certainly do love water, Isabella, but I don't think that is why their skin is wrinkly. I think that is just how... They are born, and I'm not too sure why they have such wrinkly skin. But I don't think it's because of the fact that they like water. Hippopotamus, who also like water a lot, and their skin is smooth.
I've well, just been listening to an update from Aubrey on the radio. He's just headed out with his guests and he got a glimpse of Karula this morning. So that was the female leopard that James raced off to that I was also searching for. I was on tracking team and also rushed into the area as soon as we got that report. Sadly though, when Aubrey saw her later this morning, she was crossing the Buffalshook boundary into Buffalshook. So she's probably also a no-go for this afternoon. But just good to know where she's moving and where she is and that she's still safe and sound. And I'm sure a lot of you are happy to hear the updates on Krula who has been a star of the show. We don't see her as much as we would like to anymore. And so territory seems to be more up in Buffalo than here on Juma. I'm thinking of probably leaving these elephants although I've just spotted one more that we can wait to cross the road. And then we'll continue and see what else we can find. I would like to look, get across to the western side of Juma onto Arethusa as that was the last known position of where Shadow and her cubs Madiba were moving. I love the way they use their feet as an extra tool for getting the tasty morsels that they are looking for. Now I wonder if this elephant's going to try and move this fallen down tree. Well we'll come back to it if it does. Jean has just spotted another one crossing the road. Up ahead. Seems to be on the go slow this one. I said I'm not sure why these elephants have such wrinkly skin and Jim Butler says wrinkly skin is often anti-predator and that may be the case Jim but I don't see how that's applicable with elephants because they don't really have any natural predators except for very few scenarios where they are predated on by lions but like I said that's very unique and not a common scenario in Africa so I'm not sure how much I'm willing to go with that suggestion but thank you very much for sending that comment through Itchy ear. Oh, I wonder what's in there that's bothering her. Wonderful. What a great way to start off the safari with a herd of elephants and there's one last straggler that I've just seen that I wasn't expecting quite a young calf that's drifted away from the rest of the herd
Well, good afternoon, Steve Blake. That's a name I haven't heard before. And good to have you on safari with us. Steve, Steve is interested to know if families or herds of elephant will intermingle with other herds. And yes, they certainly will, Steve. I'm not sure if you were tuned in a little bit earlier when I was speaking about a specific female that's got a short trunk. And interestingly, she's kind of the opposite to the norm. And she moves around most of the time just with two of her offspring. And that's uncommon. It's usually multiple mothers that form family herds with all their offspring. And she joins up with her two offspring with other herds from time to time. So we do see them together and then she peels off and then we see just the three of them together. But throughout Africa, herds of elephants will intermingle and move together depending on the time of the year. Sometimes where animals have to move huge distances in search of water and food, almost seasonal migrations. Then you'll get thousands of elephants moving together. But when they, once they get to the point where they need to get, then they'll disperse again. So they do move together and they're often quite peaceful animals. Unless, of course, there's a shortage of food and or water, they can become quite defensive over water holes and feeding areas. And it's not always the case, but even then females will get aggressive with other females and males with other males, even possibly with other species. And also, importantly, Steve, is that Elephants do not have bulls that are in charge of the herds. It's a matriarchal system. So there's a female within each herd who is in charge. And males simply come and go when there are opportunities to mate. And as soon as they've competed for and mated with females, they'll move off and carry on with their own lives and you'll find the young elephant bulls within the herd will probably stay there for between 10 years of age and 15 years of age before they head off and form bachelor herds. Well, getting, keep getting pleasantly surprised by more and more elephants. This one's carrying a snack. And as South Africans, we would use the term patkos for carrying food on the road. If we're going on a long journey, we'll pack some patkos. And that's an Afrikaans word meaning directly translating to road food. And it looks like these Ellies have got some patkos. And are uh, certainly enjoying it. Look at all the mud caked on this youngster's ear. Looks like some kind of a horrible growth skin problem, but it's not. It was just mud caked on its ear. And they will throw mud all over their bodies to initially cool down. But there's a long-term plan, and that is to completely cover up all insects and parasites in this layer of mud that then hardens and becomes easier to remove the parasites off and they'll remove the mud and the parasites simultaneously by rubbing against trees and hopefully we'll get to see that more and more in the summer months when the parasite load increases it's my favorite thing watching an elephant rubbing itself up and down a tree one of my favorite things I've just switched stop now, but not at the right moment. There was a bird that flew off, and that quite often happens. Now, I'm told the wrinkly skin debate has caused quite a lot of conversation. And a few of you are saying that the wrinkly skin can be used for thermoregulation. And um, not entirely sure how having wrinkly skin will help animals to thermoregulate. It will mean increased surface area, and increased surface area may help with cooling, but that would only be applicable if you were to be sweating and you had a larger surface area 
with which your sweat could be evaporated and the evaporating process is a cooling process but they don't sweat I guess once they've thrown water over their body then the evaporation of that water will help them to cool so that's where it would become applicable and that was Maggie M and Jane I think that put forward that that hypothesis which is plausible another one was that they have wrinkly skin to grow into but they've got they've always got wrinkly skin so they're never going to grow into it so I, I don't i don't think that's a plausible one but that's just me i'm not saying that's right and wrong and it's a friendly debate here and i could well be wrong and it won't be the first time that i have been proved wrong by you guys so feel free to keep trying to work out what's what with that I think thermoregulation is possibly the most plausible of theories that have been put forward so far. Really happy about the cloud cover this afternoon, it's keeping us nice and cool. And cool weather for us is also cool weather for the animals and it's just more likely to find animals in a comfortable state predators on the move when we do have cooler weather it's one thing i'm not looking forward to in the summer months because when we do get into the heights of summer the chances of seeing predators moving during the daylight hours becomes far far less than the chances of seeing them on the move in the daylight during the winter So at the moment we are heading in the completely wrong direction in terms of where I would like to get to this afternoon. So we're heading directly east on a central road that's called Central Road. It's central on Juma. And we're going to bend to the south and then work our way back west a little bit later on. Well, here's a really interesting fact that Savannah and Deborah just sent through so thank you very much for this and that is that an adult bull elephant will have as much as 12,000 square centimeters or is it 120,000 either one of those two it'll, I'll get the, the confirmation now and it's basically a huge huge surface area of skin and and it's a hundred and twelve thousand centimeters squared and another interesting fact about the surface area of elephants is that their ears make up 20 percent of the entire surface area of their body which is hard to believe but it's the truth and if you look at an elephant you'll also notice at the top of their ear there's an extra flap that folds down between their ear and their head so that increases the size of the ear than when you're looking at, at it from the outside a few buffalo droppings on the road up ahead and you'll notice all these little landmines they don't look incredibly fresh sadly but we may find some buffalo around the next corner 
There were one or two large herds that were moving around, but I haven't seen them for quite some time. And this is probably a bachelor herd of bulls. There's about 35 bulls that hang around in a bachelor herd here on Juman surroundings. Just seen something move in a little cavity in the tree to our left here. I was hoping to see a monitor lizard which lives in the cavity of this tree, but I'm not sure exactly what it was that I saw move in there. Maybe it's a bird that's starting to use this cavity as. Oh, look! Look at this! Yay! Second bird's nest of the afternoon. And it's a beautiful lilac breasted roller. Well, fancy that. A stroke of fortune. Now, interestingly enough, this time last year there was a woodlands kingfisher nesting in this very same cavity and we actually got to see it bring back a little snake that it fed to its chicks also a brightly turquoise colored bird they haven't got back from their migration yet up to central and north africa but the woodlands kingfisher is another bird that is going to add to the competition of the cavity nesters and it's also going to add to the cacophony of bird sounds that we hear in the summer months. Chick -brrr. Is the call that we will hear ringing out all day and sometimes all night, especially on full moon. That's the lilac breasted roller that we can hear calling. And they're incredibly pretty birds, but their call certainly doesn't match their beauty. It's quite a harsh call. And I just want to stay here because there is a very slight chance that it's going to do its display. And they are called rollers because they have this rolling flight pattern that they do. And it's specifically at this time of the year. And they often let off that call just before they start descending. And what they'll do is they'll actually continue to call like that as they fly up. And they usually fly up in circles. Oh, there's a little spider web that's got a touch to Jean Ray's camera I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to see it there Jean -Dre. it's probably gonna it's just like a cameraman's nightmare when somebody asks him to f zoom into a piece of spider web yeah oh well then but he's got it and this has also been incredible to note just in about a week or so since this first rain there are spider webs everywhere and when I was off on foot tracking this morning I got reminded about the spider webs and the effect they have just getting covered in them as we walk along. Anyway, as I was saying, the lilac breasted rollers will fly up in circles, making that funny noise, chop, 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 until they ascend to a point that they can do two different descents, one of which is kind of a roller coaster looping, roll like this, where they'll go up and then almost stall and go backwards and then go down, and then right at the end of the initial looping roller coaster display, then they'll go from side to side and that's going to be a tricky one for the cameraman to capture but we will be trying so brace yourself for the lilac breasted roller display we will get it eventually it may take us a few failed attempts but that's often the case with the birds who are so often difficult to film and to show you but we will keep trying and now we know at least where another bird's nest is. Virtual starling, lilac breasted roller so far. I wonder how many more bird's nests we're going to find this afternoon. What will be interesting is if a pair of African harrier hawks come back to this tree right here. Because they nested here last year. And in the main fork of this tree you will notice a whole clump of twigs 
and that is the remains of their nest from last year. Sadly, they were quite skittish, and even though we tried our best to habituate them and get them used to the vehicles, the adults didn't really allow us to view them on the nest. And once Brian and I had done a stake out here, and we waited for about 40 minutes as the two adults flew around, and some of you will probably remember quite clearly, we were actually lucky enough to see them. Oh, look, wait, look in the tree there, Jandre, on the left. I think it's actually sitting in the tree. One of the adults. Can you believe it? Yep. That's the African Harrier Hawk, all right. Not the best view. But it certainly is the bird, and who knows, maybe there's already a nest, lay, an egg laid in that nest. Anyway, as I was saying, Brian and I sat here for about 40 minutes and we got to see the adults change the color of their bare skin on their face. And these birds have the incredible ability to change the skin from yellow to bright pink. And that's during mating and courtship or any, any general excitements. And I've just pulled out my book here to show you exactly what I mean. So if you take a closer look at this bird at the top. And what you may have seen from that brief glimpse was the barred chest of the African Hawk. You probably couldn't see the head too clearly. But you'll see here it can be yellow or pink. And Brian and I were lucky enough to show you that from this very spot where we park now. And upon our decision to leave the area, because they wouldn't come back onto the nest, the car wouldn't start. So we ended up spending basically a full three hours parked here. <laughs> it was a memorable morning. And while I've got my book out, I've just got a question through from John, and good to have you with us, John. John just needs me to clear up something for him quickly. Earlier, we had a look at the Birchall Starling. That was the first nest we found this afternoon. And John asked if that was a regular Birchall Starling or a glossy Birchall Starling. Now, basically, how it works is there's only the Birchall Starling, and then you get either the Cape Glossy Starling, in this area, which is not very common, or more commonly, the greater blue-eared starling. So those are the two main starlings that we get in this area. The Meave starling, which has the longest tail of them all, is further north in the Kruger National Park. So I guess it's just the terminology that you're getting a little bit mixed up with there, John. And it's only the Birchall starling we get here. You don't get a glossy Birchall starling. Now, all the starlings are basically glossy causes a difference in their sheen is actually the weather and the, the, the sunlight shining on them. So depending on what angle we're filming them at or what angle the sun's hitting them at, they may appear quite dull and drab or they may iridesce this beautiful shiny purple blue. I'm just going to creep forward and see if we can't get you a better view of this African Harrier Hawk. Maybe our habituation methods last year paid off, and that's why it's sitting here now. Oh, no. There it goes. Well done, Jandre. Incredibly slick camera work to get you guys there as it landed in the next tree. Very good. We may be able to get you a clear, clearer view of it from this next perch. I 
again I've put Jandra in a tricky scenario the sunlight oh, wouldn't have been in his favor but oh that's wonderful camera work because even though it was flying you still got to see that yellow face well done sir and I'm glad you got to see that because now hopefully the next time you see them they are in a lot of things they can change it in a matter of seconds literally one would fly in and as it was flying in it would have a pink a yellow face and the moment it lands next to the other one instantaneously the skin goes pink and there are some a lot of the animals out here that do have these remarkable capabilities that we often don't know about and get very surprised by when we see them and that was one of them the first time I saw that I couldn't believe my eyes seen a lot of birds and a lot of elephants so far but not many antelope until now and there's a cute little baby in Yala in and amongst them the one that's just disappeared behind this tree there look at that cute there's all different shapes and sizes within this herd there's a young male overtaking it now a few adult females you see that young male he's starting to go brown dark chocolate brown but he's kind of in between now all in yellow when they're born are this rusty orange color but the males will become dark chocolate brown as they become older and that male would have all likely had been born kind of this time last year interesting that they're still grazing on grass it's something that Anyala won't very do very often but in this incredibly dry winter that we've had both the Anyala and the kudu have resorted to grazing even though they are technically browsers if they have to they will feed on grass and after the little rain that we got you can even see the little shoots of green coming up there and the grass has been the fastest plant to respond to the rains and it boggles my mind how something can lie dormant for so many months almost six months of the year and after just one rainfall come back to life good news for a lot of the herbivores who like I said have had a very tough dry season it's meant for easy pickings for the predators because a lot of the herbivores especially the old ones and weak ones lost condition very quickly during the dry season made for easy meals but now the herbivores have got luck back on their side and they'll be regaining strength day by day Wonderful. So we're slowly racking up some great sightings and we've been extremely lucky this afternoon. We haven't had to travel too far before having to stop and enjoy a sighting of various animals. So let's hope it stays that way. <laughs> the last station not copying you clearly.
still some more buffalo dung and tracks on this road. I don't think anyone drove here this morning, so I'm not convinced that how fresh they are, but they are heading in the same direction as we are. So we could bump into them shortly. Like I said, I'm not convinced at how fresh they are. Telling how fresh tracks are is an incredibly difficult art that I am certainly no maestro at. But the fact that their dung seems to have dried out a bit is the main thing that I'm going on here. I really want to get a closer visual. Let's get closer. This impala looks like it's got some war paint on its face. And I'm not sure why exactly this is, but it, its face looks to be covered in mud. Unless it's something else. It's the one in the middle there, Jean Ray. I don't know. If it seems to be moving off a bit quickly. Oh. And now it's stopped in the perfect place where you cannot see. But don't worry, we are not going to give up that easily. And we're going to try and get another view of this impala and work out why it's got makeup on. There we go. Oh, uh, shame. Its eye appears to be weeping profusely. Its ears are quite tattered. Maybe it's just an old boy who's feeling the effects of this harsh dry winter. He doesn't seem to be in the best shape. And you can probably, yeah, he's a bit skinny. And you can see all the fluid leaking down his eyes. What led me to believe he had some face paint on and it appeared to be on both sides of his face more so on the left which is a side we got a better look at he's now just having a little toilet break that's what that funny pose is all about he appears to be having a little bit of trouble actually with this whole toilet break but there we go some little chocolate whispers are dropping out there Whispers are a chocolate that we get here in South Africa, which are round and filled with wafer in the middle. They're very tasty and they can be used to describe the Impala's droppings as well, I guess. Let's see if it turns its head a little bit to the right and we get to see its other eye. Yeah, both eyes. Shame, boy. I almost wonder how well it can see. Because they did seem to have a slight white tinge coming over them and maybe it's doing a lot of listening to help it get from A to B. It doesn't seem too sure-footed when it hits something. Anyway, there still are a few easy meals out for the predators then. Just had a squirrel alarm calling up ahead of us. And before that, I heard some go away birds alarm calling. So, just wondering, I want to try and pinpoint where it is. It sounds like it might be in the riverbed down to our left. So, we may have to go back and then drop into the riverbed. Just give me a moment please. Okay. We're going to drop back down into the drainage line, which is where I think it's coming from. And it's been quite some time since we've done a riverbed cruise and it's a great way to enjoy the varying scenery out here. The riverbeds are lined with beautiful big trees and is one of my favorite places to view leopard in.
And who knows, maybe it is a leopard that the school is alarm calling out. It could be a bird of prey at this time of the year now that there's a lot more reptiles moving around. It could be a snake. The trick now is to try and find the squirrel and see where it's looking. Well, often in these scenarios you hear alarm calls rush into the area and then you either can't find the animal that was alarm calling or it stopped. Let's hope that's not the case now, but I can't hear the squirrel calling anymore. Maybe that's just because the engine's running. Stop and listen again. Last station, I'm copying you two out of five. Okay. Squirrel's still up ahead. Heard it again. Chicka 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 chicka. It was my impersonation, not a very good one. Come on. What could it be? The last time I was in this riverbed responding to a squirrel alarm call, it was actually with jean -Dre. And I got off the vehicle to check up on one of the banks where we couldn't see over. And the squirrel continued to alarm call. And what is unique about this is that I was only about a meter away from the squirrel, very, very close. And the squirrel continued without any sign of being nervous about me, still looking into this little fork of a tree right next to me and all of a sudden a genet took out so it helped us find a little genet and again John it was really quick on the camera and managed to get you a glimpse of that genet the alarm calls now sound like they are coming from further ahead of us in an impenetrable area that we cannot get the vehicle to hmm and I don't want to leave you guys stranded here, which means I will probably not be taking a walk up there to have a look around. I just wanted to stop and listen just for a few more seconds just to see if we couldn't get any more clues. But it's pointless me walking up there to check for anything for a few reasons. It's very difficult to get there in a vehicle. So even if I did find three leopards in a tree, we would battle to get there. And it may take me quite a while to find those three leopards in the tree. So we're going to just continue. But it's important to know that Alarm calls can be such an important way and such a useful way for us to find animals. Still keeping a beady eye out on the left, which is where the squirrel was alarming, that something may just pop out. But it's something that I was chatting to James about the other day. It's going to become increasingly more difficult for us to find whatever the animals are alarming up, be it squirrels, monkeys or birds, because there are so many smaller predators that are going to be out and about now, mainly snakes. That squirrels, monkeys and birds will all alarm call and mob. Some go away birds having a quick conversation there but I think that's got to do with courtship at this time of the year. They're getting very vocal but that's amongst one another and not necessarily a go away bird. You may have seen a glimpse of a diker shooting across there. 
All I saw was a blur, very small grey antelope. about to have an incredible, incredible view, I hope, of a male in Yala. And what's going to make this special is that we are going to be at eye level with him temporarily. Hold on, Jean-Andre. But you can see that beautiful dark chocolate brown coat, which is where the youngster we saw earlier was on the way to getting in terms of coat coloration so i'm glad you got to see the females and the youngsters earlier with that rusty orange color now you've got to see a fully grown male well good i would have been happy that we bumped into this other in yarana because she mentioned that if there was a competition for the antelope with the most beautiful tail. The Anyala would win that competition for her. And I completely agree, Gadda. They've got beautiful tails and their whole body actually from tip to toe is pretty impressive, I feel. Another antelope related to the Kudu and the Anyala worth having a look at is called the bongo and i've only ever seen them in captivity at a breeding center in kenya but it's very inyala like far larger though and incredibly pretty so what i'm going to do is get out the book and find the bongo which shouldn't take me too long It's like a Inyala on steroids, basically. It's huge. And the males can weigh up to 300 kilograms. So even bigger than a kudu. And they live in very dense, dense jungles in Central and East Africa. Although having a look at its tail here, its tail is not nearly impressive, as impressive as the Inyala. But it's cut quite similar. And its size is quite spectacular. And just the fact that they are so rare and elusive, I guess is a contributing factor to why I love them so much. It's also part of the spiral horned antelope family. So we have the bushbuck, the Inyala and the Kudu from smallest to largest in this area of the park we've also got the eland which is not very similar looking to the bongo or the inyala or the kudu or the bushback but also a member of the spiral horned antelope family more clouds are beginning to form and build up. Earlier I'd probably say it was one-eighth cloud cover. Now it's increased to probably three-eighths cloud cover. And I wonder when we're going to get the next rain. I don't think the clouds that are forming now are going to bring us any, but in the coming weeks and months we can expect a few deluges of rain which will most certainly have an impact on the safaris it does if you out here as a real guest as does it have an effect if you are joining on our safaris from wherever you may be around the world so that's something to bear in mind we may have to cancel the odd drive is obviously not something we're looking forward to but it is a reality that we all have to start wrapping our heads around
eventually we are heading west. We are finally getting closer towards my initial plan, which was to head into the general area of a female leopard called Shada and her cub Madiba. There was no reports of the tracks or any sign of them this morning, but that's why I'd like to go and work the area where they were last moving and see if maybe they haven't moved again. They may have been on a kill for a few days and now finish that and moved. It's a very tricky thing at this time of the year and we've got spoilt in the winter months with very dry and dusty roads which leave very clear tracks of animals as they walk. But after the rains, a lot of these roads have solidified again and make for close to impossible tracking. Interesting questions has come through from Jim Butler and he's asking whether the coming rains will have an impact on the nocturnal animals in this area and not that I can think of no. Um, I guess the nothing major though I mean I guess maybe the hippos will be able to come out of the water later at night because there's more food around, they don't have to travel as far as they do in the in the winter months when it's drier and they're probably more hungry so they'll head out of the water earlier in the winter and come back later in the morning, longer periods of time feeding whereas in summer they'll become shorter, so that's one example of a change of a nocturnal grazer but in terms of the smaller critters like white-tailed mongooses, bush babies Aardvark, there are not going to be major, major differences that I can think of. If there are any other specific animals, Jim, that you can think of that you're wondering about in terms of their behavior, please let me know what those specific animals are, and then we can try and work out if there may be any changes. But other than the hippo, really, there's no major differences that I can think of. that would be bought on at least by the rain. That's got me thinking though, but can't really think of too many good examples of any major changes. I know a lot of you have been asking to, for the presenters to find your spot where you can take a photograph and over the coming weeks keep going back to that same spot so you can get a kind of a time lapse of changes in the environment and scenery that we will experience here. So I'm going to choose my spot right now and it is here at the treehouse waterhole and what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop right here and what I want to incorporate is the weaver's nests that hang up to our side here and wanna, if you can just go wide John, right, sorry and as well as a dam, and yeah, we can maybe use the base of the tree as the right hand frame. So, not the best lighting at the moment, and we should probably do this every morning as opposed to afternoon. But this is going to be the spot that I want to monitor with all of you. And we can expect some massive changes in scenery in terms of the vegetation growth, the water level rising, as well as new weaver's nests coming in to where we can see the current older ones. 
scenery as it unfolds. So fire away with your screenshot now, and I'm sure you've already done it. And we'll just keep coming back and allowing you to take photographs as the weeks progress, and you should be able to get some interesting changes in scenery.